Well, good morning, everyone. Are you excited to hear the word of God? <laughs> I am too. I just, I have this obsession with the voice of the Lord. How many of you are with me? Well, uh, let me pray and then we'll get into the scriptures. Uh, but before I do, don't forget, we have a night of worship coming up with Dominique Hughes, Jackie Baker, and myself over at the Ministry Center. We're just going to worship with no agenda. How does that sound? <laughs> Praise God. Well, come on out. But let me pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. He is everything to us. He's our only way of seeing you, knowing you, experiencing you. And we thank you for the Holy Ghost here right now, installed inside of each one of us. I call upon your name, God, and I ask you to quicken our hearts to hear your word, that its effect will be maximum in your precious name. Amen. Turn over to Song of Solomon, chapter 2. I want to talk to you today about the bridegroom's invitation to come away. You say... <clears throat> Song of Solomon is unique. Song of Solomon is special because of things that we have revealed to us in the scriptures. One of them is from John the Baptist. He says that the friend of the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, hears his voice. John is talking of Jesus. He calls him a bridegroom. And Jesus says when uh, the, the disciples won't fast, when the bridegroom is with them, the bridegroom, Jesus calls himself bridegroom. John the Baptist calls Jesus bridegroom. In the end, the church is called the bride. So just to lay a foundation, when we look at the book of Song of Solomon, what we are seeing is a beautiful picture of Christ's love for his church. Paul tells us this in Ephesians 5. You guys know these things. We're going to look into them today. John Flavel, 400 years ago, wrote this. Certainly the whole gospel is nothing but the charming voice of the heavenly bridegroom. Praise God. Song of Solomon chapter 2, at the end of verse 13, we have these words put together from the bridegroom to the bride. He says, come away with me. Come away with me. I have three major points that I want to touch on. One, God's desire is to be with you. Two, what it means to be with him. And three, what he's looking for when you are with him. So the next verse, it says this. Oh, my dove. This is the bridegroom talking to the bride. Already established, this is the one who loves you and gave himself for you, the bridegroom himself, lover of all lovers, speaking to your heart. And he says this, Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep pathway, let me see your form. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your form is lovely. This is our text for today, and it makes my heart start leaping like Elizabeth's child in her belly when Mary's greeting comes. <laughs> I feel a, a, a rush on the inside of my actual blood when I hear of how much God wants to be with me. This verse right here is an invitation, a calling. Come away with me, my love. What kind of come away? This is different than just the Daily abiding, John 15, Jesus tells us to abide in him. Uh, Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. There is an endless preoccupation with God that should govern our lives. Everything should be bathed in prayer, and we should do all things giving thanks to the Father through the Son, as Paul tells us in Ephesians. We see these things in our lives, but this is specific. It is a calling away, away from people, away from things, it shows his desire is to have some personal time with you. He says, oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock. I want to say a couple of things about why he calls her dove. A dove is very interesting. It's not a vulture. <laughs> come away, oh, vulture. <laughs> it's not come away, oh, hawk. 
with great eyes and intelligence. It's not this. It's not come away all you bears or all you lions. It's, it's come away with me, my love, my dove. The dove has a couple of interesting things about it. One, it is a faithful bird. It has one mate. When he calls her dove, he's calling out this heart of singularity. He's calling to her saying, I'm your only love and you're my only love. He's saying bridal union, bridal commitment. One heart, one covenant, one love. Oh, my dove, come away with me. A single heart, a single eye. Jesus says, if your eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light. And if your eye is not single, you'll, you won't be filled with light. <laughs> it's the single eye Jesus calls to. Do I have all your heart? Do I have all your affection? Do I have all your attention? Am I the one that captivates your heart? Have you given to me the unrivaled surrender of a, a, a mastery over all your affections? Have you given this to me? This is what he's saying when he says, my dove. It's interesting, too, that a dove is a bird that is hunted. And the dove has to hide from birds of prey. And this is very much like us. How many of you have ever felt hunted by the enemy? The Bible says the whole world lies underneath the power of the wicked one. Every billboard, every conversation, everything that's happening in this wicked, dark world is hunting you, but you can hide in him. A couple of things also that the scriptures tell us about doves that are absolutely incredible. And for the sake of time, I'll just reference Psalm 55, verse 6. David says, oh, if I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and I'd be at rest. When he calls her dove, he's calling her to fly away from all the commotion, all the sound, all the busyness, and be at rest. Jesus, point number one, is still being established. He wants to be with you. He calls you away to be with him, not just the abiding place. We love the abiding place, and we need the abiding place. But this is something secret. This is something individual, something special. Oh, my dove. Another thing about uh, the dove in Jeremiah 48, 28, it tells us that the dove dwells, listen to this, dwells inside the rock. We know that Jesus is, is our rock. God is our rock, and we can hide in him. Our life is hidden with Christ in God, praise God. You hide inside of him. Also in Ezekiel 7, 16, the dove is, escapes, escapes. How many of you have ever just needed an escape? I'll tell you, you have a place of protection. You have a place in him as God tells Moses, there is a place by me. <laughs> there is a place by me. Man, that right there, that, that, that thought moves my heart. It, it, it literally is the motivation and engine of my own life that there is actually a place next to the Lord. And it's in, you're invited there. My goodness. God wants to be with you. God desires to be with you. He longs for you. I've been reading John, Fla uh, 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 John Owen on communion with God, and he, he's talking about how we've, we've looked at God as if he's critical and angry and, and difficult and, and harsh, and it keeps us from running to him. He actually says in there, he says, misapprehensions of God cause men to run away. But it's to see him as he is that draws you away. That he longs to be with you. He longs to, to enjoy you. Also, the, the dove, not only is it a, a faithful bird, and not only does it hide, and not only is it called to escape and fly away into this special place. In Hosea chapter 11, verse 11, the dove settles in Zion. <laughs> this is what he's looking for when he calls you dove, to settle in him, no longer tossed to and fro, no longer, oh, ho, hum, I'm not sure what I want. No, settle here. Settle with me. This is what he calls when he calls for us to be doves. Jesus actually uses dove as well in Matthew 10, verse 16. He says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The word used there for doves actually means without deceit or without mixture. He's saying, my dove, he's calling you to a life of no mixture. 
He's calling out to his bride to be single-minded, to be single-hearted, without deceit, without manipulation. Here I am, Lord. I give myself to you. But the next thing it says after he calls out this dove-like nature, which I speak to you, to you today as I speak to myself, and I say, oh, Lord, make me a dove, Lord. Make me a dove in my heart. That single-minded, single-eyed, hiding in you, resting in you, escaping to you, settling in you. God, make me a dove today, Lord. And then it goes on here, and she says, or he says, in the clefts of the rock, the clefts of the rock are very interesting. As a matter of fact, in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 16, the clefts of the rock are associated with a safe place. I need a safe place for my mind. I need a safe place for my heart. Because just being and living in this world, you get stabbed in the back by people you love. You get people that, that come against you for preaching the gospel, your family members, or whatever, that, that dis respect you or dishonor you or, or you have things in this world that just kind of mess with your mind. If you just look at the world today, it's absolutely ridiculous and it can mess with your mind. I need, and I, I venture to say that you too, as fellow humans, that you need also a special resting safe place for your mind and your heart. And this is called the clefts of the rock. <laughs> Praise God. The clefts of the rock are very interesting. In Obadiah, he says that the clefts of the rock are, listen to these words, above the earth. <laughs> above the earth. That's detached from the lower things. The clefts of the rock is where, where God detaches you from all those earthly, worldly cares and concerns and holds you in his own arms in safety. And you, you feel the sweet beating of his, his heartbeat and you feel the warmth of his holding and you feel as if you've been removed from the world. You taste the world to come by being held in the clefts of the rock. I pulled this quote from this woman of God who's a hero of mine. And she writes this. She writes, when Jesus cried out, it is finished. The rocks were split open. When Jesus cried out, he was finished. Then those hiding places opened up in which you were invited to hide away from the enemy. When Jesus said it is finished, he split open a place by himself for you. Praise God. She goes on, no enemy can reach her in this precious retreat. Neither can any enemy get her out of it because by faith she abides in Christ. <laughs> is the enemy tormenting you? Hide away in the cleft of the rock. Is there something that is disturbing you or distressing you? Do you feel that you must say or do something in order to make it right or prevent harm or reproach? Hide away in Jesus in the clefts of the rock. Commit your way to him and he will bring it to pass. Are you misunderstood? Are you unjustly accused? Are you maligned? Find a cleft in the rock called Christ and hide away. For this rock was a cleft for you and for me that our lives might be hidden with Christ. Oh, and people who see us, they do not know that we're hiding away in the cleft of the rock. They only see a heavenly supernatural calm which abides through every storm, hurricane. But God knows we are hiding away in the rock and the devil knows whence comes this victorious quiet. Praise God. Say, Eric, what are, you, what are you pointing at? I'm trying to say his number one desire from you is that he would have a love relationship with you in which he holds you. I'm telling you, if, if your life is not lived this way, you're living beneath what he opened for you. If your life is not lived this way, then your heart is lacking things that are already yours. He goes, she goes on or he goes on and says in the secret place in the steep pathway. The steep pathway is very interesting because it goes from the ground upwards. And this is not traveled by many. The steep pathway is not traveled by many and it goes from the, from the earth up into the heavens. He's calling you up. And just, just know this, you aren't called to hewn out your own pathway. He hewned it out for you. <laughs> he opened it for you. You, you, don't, you don't need to, I, I hate to, I'm not throwing shade on anything, but you don't need to fast enough to be able to experience God. You, you have it because of the gospel. That's the gospel. You, you, you don't need to clean up your life in order to be able to experience God. 
You experience God and God cleans up your life. Sometimes we get in this, we put the car before the horse and we think we've got to be like Jesus in order to experience God. But it's backwards because you experience God and he makes you like Jesus. So you, you call yourself, he calls you to come away, he calls you to the secret place of the, the clefts of the rock and the secret place of the, the steep pathway. This is the second point is what is it that he calls us to? It's, it's this secret place. You say, Eric, what is the secret place? And in, in Psalm 31, 20, this is absolutely amazing. Just, just look at it with me real quick. We've got, we've got about 10 minutes left. So let's look at this. Psalm 31, Verse 20, just to show you what it is to spend time with the Lord. Look at 19. Let's just go back to 19. How great is the sweetness you have stored up for those who fear you. Man, he's already packed the room. He's already packed the room with sweetness for you. How great is the sweetness he has stored up. He's wait- it's as if he's, he's just saying she'll come at some point. And it's waiting here. How great is the sweetness he has stored up for those who fear him. Look at this. Which you have wrought. He wrought it for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. Here it is. You hide them in the secret place of your presence From the conspiracies of men, you keep them securely in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Do you see what the secret place is? It's the secret place of his presence. It's it's being with him. It's, It's to enjoy him. He calls you into his presence and there you're shielded and you have sweetness there to be experienced and you have shelter there. He he, he guards you and he keeps you himself. I mean, I don't have a shield big enough to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy, but he does. And I can hide in him and find in him everything that I'm, I'm looking for. You guys know he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you live a life of going into this secret place, you get the divine shadow cast over your life. And there's a shade there. There's a shade there from the heat of life. And now lastly, I'm going to just touch on what he's looking for when you respond to his invitation to come away and, and have this wonderful experience with him in his arms. What is he looking for from your heart? Well, it says there, let me see your face and let me hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your form is lovely or your uh, maybe it's the other way around but these two things are what is he's looking for he's looking for your form and he's looking for your voice you say eric what is this that it's pointing to well to me when you reveal your face to the lord it means three things vulnerability it means honesty and it means surrender what's he looking for vulnerability what does that mean tell him everything Honesty, what does that mean? Don't just tell him everything. Tell him how you really feel about those things. And then what does that surrender mean? It means then give all that to him. The the scripture says God is a refuge for us. Pour out your hearts before him. You see, if we think that God is harsh and we have these bad ideas of God, we'll never tell him what we really think. We'll wear a mask coming to be with God. But if you know anything about what Jesus is saying against Speaking against, he speaks against hypocrisy. Hypocrites. Hypocrite comes from interpreter beneath, meaning they wear masks to charade. It's a beauty pageant. It's fake. And what he's saying here, what I want from you, he's saying, is take off your mask. Tell me everything. Lord, I did this. Lord, I did that. And then you tell him honestly, I did this because... And then you say, I give it to you. I give it to you, Lord. I need you. So this is what he's looking for. Your face and then your voice. He wants to hear adoration and love and worship and the prayer of heart communications and praise and the acknowledgement of him. Lord, we praise you. We worship you. This is so sweet to him. 
The, the, the word that is connected with why he wants to see you vulnerably honest and surrendered to him is lovely. Your face is lovely. The word lovely means attractive. This is attractive to God when you choose to go away from everybody, enter into the sweet experience of his presence by opening your heart and telling him what's really going on with all honesty, all honesty. You know, I feel like the Lord is just waiting sometimes for us to actually admit something like this. Lord, I don't love you like I used to love you. That's, that's telling him everything. And then you go even deeper and say, Lord, I don't even feel even like I can or that I even really want to grow in it. I'm being honest with you, Lord. And then you say, I give this to you. Help me. That's, that's scraping the bottom of the barrel and being completely, and then, then God looks down and he says, finally, now we can work. I was waiting for you to admit this about yourself, and now I can begin my work in your life. The boulder that stands between people and God is literally not being completely honest with him. Martha Kilpatrick once wrote, God has no fellowship with liars. To, to be honest and open before him. This is the key. So this is attractive to him, and your voice is sweet. This is pleasurable to him. Charles Spurgeon wrote this, and this is what I'm trying to point at. There is an elevation that lifts the soul above all earthly things and bears the spirit up beyond where eagles soar, <laughs> even into the clear atmosphere where God communes with men. There is a higher place. There's a place called the clefts of the rock. There's a secret place of the most high. There is actually a place by him that he calls you to and longs for you to come to. And there you experience the bliss and wonder that is so transformative. And this is what he's looking for there. It's for you to be completely truthful with him and honest because this is, this is what he desires and longs for. I'll tell this story, and if Matt, if Matt could jump up here, how amazing was Matt Gilman today? Goodness gracious. Um, if a vault with trillions of dollars is opened up to a man, and the owner of all the money says, go in, and you can take as much as you want, if that man leaves with a penny, whose fault is it that he's poor? It's his fault. God, through Christ Jesus, has opened up the vaults of heaven and given you access to the riches of the world to come. He's given you access to hear the voice that causes the cedars to, to crumble, the voice that strips the forest bare, the, the voice that breaks rods of iron, the voice that created the world. He's given you access into this. And, and, and if you're lacking peace and you're lacking joy and you're lacking satisfaction and fulfillment, I'm telling you, it's because you went into the vault and you took a penny. There is for you peace that passes the ability to be understood. There is joy unspeakable and full of glory. There is satisfaction at the sweetness of the honeycomb of Christ. It's for you. And it's not because you're awesome. Because I'll save you the suspense, you're not. It's because Jesus is amazing. And he will take you in his arms. And he will hold you and he'll drain out these inward poisons and he'll work with you and he's patient with you and he walks with you. And you, you may, Eric, I keep falling, I keep falling, keep coming, keep coming. Eric, I keep falling, keep coming, keep coming. Why? Because he's gonna work and he's working and he's teaching and he's forming and he's shaping. This is growing in the knowing of the compassion of the Lord. Man, he's so good. So Father, we lift our hands and we say, you are wonderful. We worship you. We praise you. We, we give you glory. You're just amazing. 
Let it be today that something shifts. Let it be today something shifts on the inside and we recognize the riches of God are in Christ Jesus. We praise you. We worship you.